I want to begin by um, bringing your attention to what's happening in Israel right now. If you haven't already been keeping track of the news, um, out of Lebanon, missiles, rockets have been fired into Israel. Nothing new for Israel, but um, they've got Iron Dome, a phenomenal mechanism by which to shoot down the vast majority of the missiles, but a couple didn't make it in. But what we're doing here tonight all has to do with Israel. And it all started in that region. And um, so our hearts go out to Israel, and they should. If you're a Christian, how many of you are Christians? All right. And, um, you know, we are, you know, who knows how many of us have actual Jewish blood in us? Don't know. Uh, but um, we are spiritually Jewish. If we're Christians, we follow the God that first revealed himself to the Jewish people and the Jewish Savior, Jesus, he was Jewish. I mean, believe it or not, he wasn't a Christian. <laughs> Think about that for a moment. But he started the whole thing off. What he, what he did was invite everybody else in. So it wasn't just the Jews. Everybody who was not Jewish was able to also have a relationship with the God of the Jews. Who is the only God in existence? The God, according to the Bible, is the one who made all the things that we see in this world. He's responsible for all of it. And when it went haywire, he took upon himself the responsibility to fix it. And that's actually the story in front of us tonight. So there are items on your table. Hopefully you haven't touched any of them yet. Don't touch them until you're instructed to do so. Um, there, it's an interesting assembly of items. And I'm going to point out what each of them represent. Um, the little half cup of juice in front of you, that is grape juice, just to let you know. Hopefully nobody's allergic to grape juice. But um, uh, you're going to take a little sip of that every time I ask you. Don't just guzzle it because it needs to last you through what we're doing. You just need a sip, okay? That um, there's a cup that has, it's clear, clear, looks like water. Yeah, don't drink that either. That's actually salt water. That'll surprise you if you try to drink that, so don't drink that. Let me begin by mentioning that in the Bible, we are told a story of the Jewish people uh, who were called Hebrews at the time and how they ended up in slavery in Egypt. And if you know the story, it happens because Joseph, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, who was sold into slavery by his brothers through an amazing chain of events, he becomes vice pharaoh. At a very strategic moment, when a famine hits, and the whole world, according to, to the Bible, is affected by this famine, and the known world of the time all end up having to go to Egypt to go get some grain, and thanks to Joseph, who had the plan of how to store up enough grain, enough food for seven years, they'd be able to then survive the famine that lasted another seven years and everybody would come and, and get some food and even his brothers who sold him into slavery end up in Egypt and they don't recognize Joseph when they see him because Joseph looks different. He's now a grown man. They sold him into slavery when he was a kid. They were jealous of him, as you know the story. And there he is with his Pharaoh stuff, and he's, he's in charge of everything, and he's speaking Egyptian. And his brothers don't recognize him. But as the story goes, he reveals himself. They're scared to death because they think he's going to pay us back and kill us. He's in charge. Uh, the opposite happens. He throws his arms around them and loves them and weeps and... 
is so happy to be back together and they go get dad who's still alive and he moves and every, the whole family moves to Egypt. And then we're told that uh, even though there was a nice friendly Pharaoh who loved Joseph, Joseph was serving a Pharaoh. Uh, I'll remind you, when we say Pharaoh, it's Pharao. It's actually how it's pronounced. It's three words, Pharao. It means son of God. We say Pharaoh. But his, uh, his relationship with Pharao is very tight. And Pharao tells Joseph, listen, your, your family can have a ton of land. We're so grateful for you. You saved our lives. Listen, y'all be here and never leave. You'll be happy and we want to grow old together. But then the Bible says that in time, another Pharao comes into power who does not care about Joseph or his descendants that are multiplying like rabbits. And he says, well, there's a whole bunch of them. In fact, I think there's more of them than there are of us. And if we don't enslave them, they might try to challenge us and take us over. So they enslave them. The Egyptians enslave the Hebrews. And we're told it's a total of 400 years that they are in Egypt from the time that they first enter with Joseph during the famine to the time when God speaks to a descendant of Joseph, a descendant of Jacob's family, a Jew. His name is Moses. And he says, Moses, uh, I've got a job for you. I've been hearing the cries of my people who were in bondage. And uh, it's time to release them. So I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. And you're going to lead them out. And the night that that happens, um, God gives some very specific instructions to Moses as to what they were supposed to do right before a certain plague comes, a terrible plague. God's already been hitting Egypt with these terrible plagues and a 10th and final plague is on its way that night. And Moses says, I've got instructions for you to tell the entire nation really fast because they're, they're about to be kicked out of the land. They're going to be driven out after I do what I'm about to do tonight. Pharaoh and all of Egypt are going to drive you, the Jewish people, out of the land. So get ready. Well, what he hears that night is what we're going to hear tonight. Y'all ready? 400 years. This is not salt water, by the way. I have a couple of non-salt water cups. There's 400 years while they're in slavery that end with something on one night where there is a sacrifice, there is a death of lambs. And then there's an emancipa emancipation right there. Immediately that night, after 400 years. Then what's interesting is that in the scripture, between what we call the Old and the New Testament, between Malachi and Matthew, another 400 years, we're told, of silence. God doesn't seem to be doing anything. Doesn't seem to be talking to anybody. There's no prophets writing between those two testaments, the Old and the New. And then all of a sudden you flip into the New Testament, and, and after 400 years, another 400 years, there's another sacrifice... And there's immediate emancipation. And it's a sacrifice of a lamb again. But the lamb of God. And this story turns out that we're going to go through. It was pointing to that lamb of God. That shows up in what we call the New Testament. It's in the 11th and the 12th chapters of Exodus the second book of the Bible, that's where we hear the story. We read the story about Moses being called by God to go to Pharaoh, which is a scary thing, and say, God, talk to me. 
had told me to tell you, you got to let my people go, his people go. How did that go over? You know, not, not, too, not too good. But God does tell him to go to Pharaoh again, because he's already been sent to Pharaoh a number of times to give warnings. And it's where God speaks to Moses before sending him to Pharaoh a final time to announce this tenth and final plague that God is going to bring upon all of Egypt that very night, beginning at midnight. And it's, it's a plague so terrible, Pharaoh is going to finally release the Hebrew people. And here's how it reads, chapter 11, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterwards, he will let you go from there. Indeed, when he lets you go, he will drive you away. Verse 4, Moses said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, about midnight I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn of the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn of the female slave who is behind the hand meal, and to all the firstborn of the livestock. Then there will be a loud cry throughout the whole land of Egypt such as has never been or will ever be again. And then God spelled out for Moses the way, the only way that the Hebrew people could avoid the plague of death that was going to touch every household of Egypt. And they were given very specific instructions that centered on the blood of a lamb that had to be sacrificed in, a, in every single Hebrew household. God also told Moses that they were to carry out these instructions every year, but in an, a ring enactment. So that they would remember and not forget what God was having them do in order to be protected from this plague of death that's coming at midnight. Exodus chapter 12 verse 14. It says, This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. God speaking. Throughout your generations you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. So when God commanded the Hebrews to do that first night and to reenact every year as what is commonly called the Passover. Because as God said in verse 11 of chapter 12, God said, it is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night. I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute my judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood of the sacrificed lamb, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Y'all with me? I want you to understand that as God was giving instructions for how to observe that first Passover, he simultaneously was giving additional instructions for how to observe all future Passovers. And he even gave that a name in verse 17. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we'll get into the meaning of that a little later on tonight. But for now, know that the first Passover was rushed. They had only a few hours to do everything that God commanded them to do. But the reenactments of future Passovers, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, God said they were going to call it. They were told to spread it out over an entire week. And what the Passover essentially was, and still is, is a dinner. And uh, I remind you, Passover is going on right now in, in Israel, right now. That's why they're getting bombed. It's a very important celebration for them. And it's a dinner, the Passover. It's historically observed by one or more families gathered around a table, uh, inside a home. And it's something like a Thanksgiving dinner, kind of like what we do. You know, we eat certain things at Thanksgiving because we are told in the history, you know, what the pilgrims and the Indians did. Usually we put on our table the kind of things that they ate, don't we? Okay. Because historically we know what they did, so that's our, our celebration. And almost every feature of this dinner, or I should say the items on your plate... Because we're obviously not having a full-blown dinner. Every item, though, what you have is there in order to pass on an important story of profound biblical truth. And it requires you that you use all five senses. So we don't just hear the story of 
God delivering the Hebrews from slavery. We smell it, taste it, we feel it, you might say. The Passover, the Pesach in Hebrew, is God's object lesson. And its purpose is to stamp God's method of redemption on the minds of future generations. And so the Passover is always supposed to be conducted with kids. You want your kids here. You want them to, to, to hear the story and, and, and touch all these things because they're very tactile and that's how they learn. And again, God commanded that this story be reenacted every year. Sadly, the Bible says that centuries would go by without the Jews observing the Passover. But by Jesus' day, the Jews had started back up with annual reenactments. And it's on the night just before Jesus is betrayed and arrested. It's that night that he hosts his own Passover dinner with his disciples. And it's usually what we call the Last Supper. But actually, it was the Passover. And Jesus told his disciples at the beginning of their Passover, in Luke's account, chapter 22, verse 15, he said, with great desire, I have desired to eat this meal with you before I suffer now, the Passover is conducted using an instruction manual. Uh, in Hebrew, it's called a Haggadah, and it means telling or narration. And simply what the Haggadah is, it, uh, it provides the order, in Hebrew, the Seder of the Passover. And of what, of what we're doing. Uh, think of it, it's kind of akin to a, to a, church, a church bulletin for those who have ever attended a, a traditional church, a uh, mainline church. I, I grew up in a Presbyterian church. And they always give you a bulletin as you come in, yeah, as you go in, and, and, and in the bulletin it tells you, okay, we're going to stand here, we're going to sit here, we're going to say this together, we're going to sing this hymn, here it is. We're gonna, th then we're going to pray this responsive prayer all together, confession of sin, th then th the sermon, then another song. Okay, that's the order, the Seder. So... That's the church bulletin. Well, this is ours right here. Got it? This is the Haggadah, but it's extensive. So at about midnight, we'll wrap it up. <laughs> we'll be good. And I hope the little slice of egg will tie you over. Probably. We'll be good. <laughs> so the Seder is the order of the Pesach in Hebrew. Passover. So when you hear, you know, it's a Passover meal or Seder, they're, they're synonymous, but the Seder is the order in which we're about to do what we're going to do. Use, it's conducted by an instruction manual, a Haggadah, right here, as we go through the Pesach, the Passover. And um, there are many versions, I must tell you, of Haggadahs, which vary from one to another in the Seder, the order, and sometimes even in the assigned meanings of the elements of the Pesach, the Passover. So it's actually up to us, and I want you to listen very carefully before we enter it. This is all introduction. Before we do this, it's up to us to study the scriptures and extra biblical texts to best construct as much as possible an accurate Seder especially as Christians who have the New Testament record. And so tonight, something like scales should fall from our eyes when we look at the Passover that Jesus held with his disciples because what Jesus was doing was showing his disciples the correlations of the Passover that these Jewish men have been doing every year since they were little kids. And he's showing the correlations of the items, the elements in the Passover to his very life, specifically his life, his death, and his resurrection, and that the Passover had been pointing to him from the very first one in Egypt. And the idea is that the whole nation over centuries was being set up through this to recognize the Messiah when he came. You getting it? So what we're going to experience tonight was first carried out by Moses almost 4,000 years ago. But we're going to go back and forth between the very first Passover as described in Exodus. We're going to consider subsequent changes in the Passover in the centuries that followed. 
And then Jesus' Passover revealed in all four of the Gospels. But we need one more source, and it's called the Mishnah. It's an authoritative compilation of the earliest known commentaries of the most influential rabbis, including one named Gamaliel. He was a teacher of the Apostle Paul. And in case anyone believes it's heresy for me to cite the Mishnah, I remind you that the Apostle Paul did not apologize for being a student of Gamaliel. In fact, it was something of bragging rights for him in Acts chapter 22, verse 3. It would be like um, being proud of your pastor who had written some of the most best, accurate Bible commentaries ever written. You know what I'm saying? Like if Chuck Swindoll was your pastor. <laughs> Guy's accurate. By the way, some of the symbolic items that are on the, the place in front of us, they're not found in the Bible. But they were passed down by oral tradition. They were included eventually in the Mishnah. They are what the Jews called kosher, which rest assured means they've been perfectly preserved. If there's anything the Jews are really good at, it's preserving flawlessly what they believe came from God. That's why when the Dead Sea Scrolls were Discovered in 1947, it was just amazing what was there. And, and that became the oldest set of manuscripts we had because the older ones that had, had been used by biblical scholars to translate what we have in our Bibles today. They thought, well, I hope that's accurate. Then they, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, even older than these, dead on. Because those that had the job of translating, they really were the ancient Mamiograph, you know, the ancient Xerox machine. Won't go into how they did it, but they flawlessly, meticulously would copy page by page. When a scroll was getting old, they'd make a fresh one. Perfectly. So you ready? Okay. Let's begin. The first thing that would happen in a Jewish household is they would do a lot of washing on what's called the day of preparation for the Passover. And you would bring out brand new dishes, dishes that are only used for the Passover. Normal everyday dishes, they go back somewhere else, you know, they go in the cupboard, but you'd bring out an, a huge set of dishes, serving trays only to be used only once a year on the Passover for the Passover meal. And their understanding was God said, that house has to be spotless. Everything you're going to eat on has to be spotless is what God spoke to the rabbis, recorded in the Mishnah. And so you are to wash everything clean. Everything, everything has to be spotless. It's a big part of the Seder, by the way. Spotless. So they prepare it. They bring out brand new dishes for the items that are going to go on it. The big meal that's going to be served. And the first thing that God commanded for the first Passover for the Jews when he spoke to Moses 4,000 years ago was make bread for your journey. You know how you pack a sack lunch before going on a trip? Well, they cooked what they could for their trip. And God told them that they didn't even have time to let their bread rise before baking it for the road. So they were told to make bread dough without yeast called unleavened bread. You read about that a lot in the Bible. Unleavened bread. And bread without leaven becomes a, a cracker. These are some big ones. And these are not saltines. Okay? Okay? Don't eat those either until I tell you to. We call that a matzah. That's what the Jews call it. And for all future Passovers, God said that every Jewish father was to search the house for chametz, which is... Leaven, yeast. And he was supposed to symbolically go through the house and the kids are watching. This is all, I love, this is so great. God told the rabbis, and, and millions of Jews have done this year after year. The father of the house has to be very concerned about leaven, yeast, in the house. 
And so he searches for it everywhere, and symbolically he does it, and he even walks around with a feather and a spoon, and in front of the kids, he there's a little imaginary yeast is left, and he, he kind of gets sad and puts it on the spoon, and he throws it outside of the house. What's interesting is that leaven is always used in the Bible as a reference for sin. You know, a little bit of leaven, leavens a whole bunch. You know, like when Adam and Eve sinned, and look at us now. You know, it spreads if leaven is kept anywhere. You know, the whole idea that sin, if it remains somewhere, it's eventually going to spread. And so God says, you've got to get rid of the leaven. I want to remind you of a, of a passage Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 to 8. He said, do you not know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Is this familiar? Okay. Clean out the old yeast... So that you may be a new batch as you really are unleavened. No yeast in you. No sin in you. Okay. For our Passover lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the festival. What festival? The festival of unleavened bread. He's, he's talking about their annual festival. That's what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians. Not with the yeast of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Does that scripture make more sense now? That's the context of it. So the rabbis tell us that after all the leaven is put outside of the house by the father, because the father does not allow leaven in the house, in his house. Catch that? Okay. It's time for the lighting of the festival candles. Uh, in Hebrew, hadlakat hanerot. And the tradition is the mother's job is to come to light candles that are on the table. And the candles represent the spirit of God, the presence of God, the spirit of God. And so at this time, I'm going to ask any mom or any, any woman at your house, at, on your table to light them in a moment. Every item, everything we do is given a blessing. That's another instruction. And um, perhaps you've seen um, a kippah. Uh, in Hebrew, a kippah. You've seen this? Go, goes on a guy's head. Okay. Um, in Yiddish, it's called a yarmulke. In Yiddish. And um, you know what this is? The idea is um, it shows respect and reverence for God. And, um, and then there's the talit. The prayer shawl. Call it a really big kippah. And it uh, goes a little, little beyond that. Um, you'll see, and we're going to see in a couple months when we go to Israel, those who are going on the trip. By the way, we have two spots open. Um, the prayer shawl, the talit, God commanded that when you pray to God, you'd use this. And consider it your portable tabernacle. Okay? And uh, it's just a little personal portable tabernacle. And when you go like this, and it looks a certain way, because God even commanded that you put these tassels on all four corners, and there are scriptures that are on the, on the corners. It's very interesting. God is very specific. He says, um, I want you to get inside of this house, little house, of prayer and pray. So we pray. So everything gets a blessing before we go. So here's the blessing before we light the candles. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Abi Shemo, Ana Madlikim Ner Shel Pasach. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, creator of the universe, whose name, in whose name we kindle the Passover lights. And there's a book of matches there on the table. If we could have a mom, light them. And I need a mom to light mine. Amy Wagner, that's usually a tradition. I have. You come up and you light my candles. Thank you so much. But a guy cannot do it. Sorry, guys. Thank you. You're like the spiritual mother of the church, you know. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. All the candles lit. Next comes the rahats. It's the washing of the hands. It's a ceremonial washing. And there would be a bowl of water on the table. There's a bowl of water in every Jewish household. By the way, these were props I didn't use, but I'll use them later. I know where I'll fit them in. Uh, the bowl of water. You're supposed to wash your hands. You know, wash your hands before you eat. That's all you do. Three times in the water. Now I'm clean. Um, you know, it's interesting when, when Jesus had his Passover, we don't read that he was washing hands, did he? He washed something else. It's very interesting. Because that, that ceremonial washing of hands is an admonition to uh, admitting to God, I, we're all sinful. And it's not that I'm washing my hands because they're, they're dirty. It's because I'm, I'm sinful. I need to be clean before God. So I, I, I wash my hands. Um, but Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't need to. He's sinless. But this is where, in fact, he, he gets up from the table and he puts a towel on his waist, it says, and he starts to wash the disciples' feet. And, and you know, again, you go, why, why, is he doing, why did he do that? Okay, I want to remind you, when, um, this is where these will come in. The first Passover, God said, you need to, to do this quick. You need to eat this. It's rushed. And, um, and he said, you will eat it. He told the men, you will eat the Passover meal. The first one 4,000 years ago with Moses. With your walking staff in your hand and your sandals on your feet. You're ready to head out the door. That's how he said, I want to see you eat it that way. You're taking me seriously. You're, you're going to be moving quick. All subsequent Passovers were to be done, conducted hasava. Hasava means reclining, Relaxed. And you have a whole week. It's not three hours. You got to get ready to get out of there. You got a whole week. And it's fun. And there's music and a lot of food because nobody's chasing you down. Pharaoh's not coming after you. You're not in slavery. It's a beautiful thing. You were, you know, you belong to God who redeemed you. He's your, he's your savior. And, and you get to just uh, recline. And on pillows, you w we wouldn't be on tables like this. You actually were supposed to eat it on the floor. And a bunch of big pillows you bring out on the Passover. And then everybody just kind of laying down on a shoulder and, and we'd be eating. The only problem is when you're doing that, your feet would probably be by somebody's face. <laughs> because you had open-toed shoes. You had sandals in the day. And you'd walk dusty roads to get to wherever you were going to have the Passover. And so a servant in the house would uh, wash the feet of the guests the moment they came in. But that's the thing Jesus then does. He does it. And you remember what he said afterwards. He said, I have set you an example that you will do what I have done for you. He said, you know, the leaders of the Gentiles lord it over them. Not so with you. This ain't about ego, power, position. It's about servanthood, serving. And I'm here to serve you. And if you remember, when he, when he got to Peter's feet, what happened? You're not touching my feet, Jesus. How many of you, you don't want anybody touching your feet? I'm, I'm going to call one of you up and I'm going to take your feet off, shoes off. I'm going to start winding your feet. How, would you be comfortable doing that? Well, that you're very, a very rare person right there. Most people, you, just, you, you know, they've got this thing about our feet. Don't really, it's kind of, you know, they smelly, dirty, whatever. They're our feet. They're closed up all day. Peter didn't want him, uh, Jesus, to touch his feet. And, you know, he, he could, you could imagine him thinking, Jesus, this is below you. And he said, not, G no, you're not washing my feet. That's for the slave or somebody, see? And that's when Jesus said, well, then, Peter, if, if I don't wash your feet, you will have no part in me. I wonder how he said it. Because after that, that's when Peter said, well then, shampoo my hair, get behind the ears, do it all. Okay? Because I don't want to miss out on whatever this is. So either way, there's the washing of the, of the hands, the Jewish, the Jews do it. We're not doing it because Jesus apparently didn't do it. But nonetheless, a blessing is spoken because it's commanded. Baruch atah Adonai Melech. 
העולם, אשר קידשנו במצוותיו וציוונו על נטלת ידיים. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who made us holy by the commandments and by commanding us concerning the washing of hands. Next, there are four cups of yayin wine. Four. You get snockered at a Passover. You know, really, that's how it is. That, that is how it is. Yeah. No snockering tonight. But um, there are four cups. Uh, you'll notice I have five. I'll talk about the fifth at the end. But there are four cups of wine, yayin, that are poured during the Pesach. And um, ours have juice. And again, you're not going to drink four glasses of juice. Just one sip from your one glass when I ask you to. And the four cups stand for the four I will statements of God found in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. 6 and 7, God simply says, I will, four times. But he says, I will, the first one is, for the first cup, kos Kiddush is the first cup. It is the cup of sanctification. It's to bless and sanctify the meal, just as God said he was going to bless and sanctify the people, the Hebrews, from Exodus 6.6. 6, the first I will statement of God was, I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians. You cover your head. Another blessing is spoken. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam borei pari hagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Everybody, take a sip. Next it would be a series of questions, specifically four questions, that traditionally the youngest child in the family is to ask the father of the family. And then the, God would, uh, the, the father would give a, um, a brief answer, but then as the meal goes on, he explains at, at length uh, the answers to the, the son's questions. But I'll simply say the most important question was, and each one starts with, Father, why is this night different from all other nights? And the most important answer the father gives is, this is the night... When a lamb died for you. There's a sacrifice. Second cup of wine is poured. They get right to it. It's Kosmakot. Uh, it's the cup of judgment. And it's based on the second I will statement of God from Exodus 6.6. 6, when God said, I will deliver you from bondage. And God did it through 10 plagues, as you know the story. 10 plagues that put pressure on Pharaoh to release his people. And we recite those 10 plagues with 10 drops of wine into a saucer. And you are to repeat them after me when I say them in English. Okie doke. Plague number one, Dom, blood. Now, by the way, that stood for when God turned all the waterways, all the water in Egypt into blood. You'd, you'd think that would do enough right there to give Pharaoh a hint to, you know, let the people go. Because it's the sign of the loss of life. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't budge. Tzitzvardaya, frogs. Kinim, gnats. Arov, flies. Dever, disease. Remember that disease of the livestock? Shechin, boils. Barad, hail. Arbe, locust. Hoshech, darkness. Makat, beharot, death of the firstborn. Baruch atah. Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam borei pari hagafen. Blessed are you, Lord our God, 
king of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. What you would imagine for a moment. When um, Makat Beharot, death of the firstborn, came. And the angel of death, whatever that looked like, went through Egypt. And in every house, every, how many is every? Every, every house in Egypt had a dead person in it. The firstborn, whoever the firstborn was in the house, died. At least one person would be dead in the house. Now I want you to imagine where you live. I want you to imagine you realize about midnight something happened. Maybe you're the firstborn in your family. Maybe a firstborn in your family is dead. But then so does the neighbor over here and the neighbor over here, the one behind you. And then people are coming out. In the street. You, just, you start to hear wailing in every house through the walls. You realize you're not the only one screaming and wailing in grief. And then you realize perhaps people are picking up on something. Everybody's going out. You lost somebody too. Uh, you imagine the grief and the screaming, the, the crying that every single thing you realize. What was this? And you understand why it was after this, they believed in the God of the Hebrews and said, they're going to kick them out. And boy, did they ever, you know how the, the story goes. It says they were literally filling the, the Hebrews pockets with gold and whatever. I mean, take this, buffing them out and driving them out. We don't want you here anymore. You can imagine why. Next, we come to the, the matzah. Uh, matzah is unleavened bread. The word matzah actually means sweet. Uh, when compared to sour, fermented dough with yeast. So God commanded the Hebrews to eat the main course, which is the lamb, with unleavened bread. So they were cooking a lamb and at the same time baking some bread real fast. And again, it symbolized their quick exodus, having no time to let their bread rise. And on the table is, um, on my table... Is something called the matzotash. If you've heard of a matzotash, um, in the, it's it's called the it's called the unity in Hebrew, and it's very inter it's inter it's just interesting. <laughs> Again, God told this to the rabbis centuries ago. Okay, I want you to put three pieces of matzah, representing the the bread you had to bake real fast as you left Egypt. You put that on your table. When you have the celebration of these years to come. But I want you to have a bag that has three compartments in it. In one bag. Three in one bag. And he says, I want you to place the top piece in the top compartment. There it is. I want you to take the bottom piece. So I'm going to move the second one away. I'm going to take the bottom piece. Put that in the bottom compartment of the bag. There it is. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you could grab the matzah. Don't crack it. It, easy, it breaks easy, but everybody kind of put your grubby hands on it. <laughs> grab a piece, pass it around. I want you to hold it up to the lights and I want you to see what you, I want you to see holes. Hold it up to the light. And do you see, do you see light coming through it? You see it? Okay. Do you know why? Because God commanded them to pierce it. You know how you pierce a baked potato, you know, or a potato to, so it bakes faster. Okay. You poke holes in it, poke hole in the bread. He said that. Okay. And, and then I want to remind you that, uh, the scripture tells us Isaiah, when he looked ahead at the Messiah, 
in the 63rd chapter of, of his, the prophet Isaiah, as he looked ahead at the Messiah, he saw that the Messiah would be pierced. I mean, his hands, feet, maybe the javelin here, the spear in his side. I want you to also notice, you have, you have stripes. Do you notice you have stripes? So centuries ago, God told the rabbis, this, this specific bread, um, you're going to lay it flat on racks as it cooks so it has stripes on it. Isaiah also saw the Messiah would be whipped by his stripes. He said we would be made whole. This, if you haven't figured it out already, is going to stand for something, for someone in particular. But it's this one that I'm holding. Uh, the, I had three pieces on my table. You have three. That's the commandment. You have three pieces of matzah. You put them all in the unity, the three-in-one compartment, the top one on the top, the bottom of the spirit of the... In the scripture, Father, Son, Spirit, there's a hierarchy in God. Father, Son, Spirit. It's never Spirit, Son, Father, or anything else. It's always Father, Son, Spirit. And um, I would dare say God was pointing ahead, you know, showing them about himself. Dad's up top, got the Spirit down here on the bottom, and the Oreo cookie, and who's in the middle? Yeah. Here's what's interesting. God then commanded that you would take that middle piece that would go in the second compartment, but you don't put it in there yet. Actually, you take it. And he said, you break it. Um, and when you break it, uh, this is called the, the yachutz. It's the breaking of the middle piece. And the commandment was, you have an extra little bag um, to put half. Mine wasn't a clean half. That bugs me. OCD. There's a better. Okay. Yeah. There. Yeah. I'll use this one. You put half in the unity, in the second compartment. The other half of the second piece goes in its own little shroud. The father, the father, is commanded in the Jewish home to wrap up this piece called the afikomen, after dish, in English, call it the dessert. It's the dessert. It's the best for last. Catch this. And you take the afikomen, and the father's supposed to hide it somewhere. All the kids close their eyes, and it becomes a game. And the, uh, the father hides it. And then at the end, at a certain time, it's going to come out. And the kids are going to have a little hunt for it. And then you'll see what we do with it. Wrong cup. Right. <laughs> <laughs> If I had a sore throat, I don't know. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Blessing is spoken. Baruch ata Adonai Elokeinu. Melech Alam. Asher Kitchenu Bimitzvata Vitzivanu. Al Nitilat Yadayim. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, who sanctified us with your commandments and concerning unleavened bread. Next comes the moror. That's Hebrew for bitter herbs, the moror. So what you're supposed to do now is take the top piece. So one of you grab the top piece on your table. Grab that top piece. Top piece, top piece of matzah. Top piece of matzah. And uh, you're going to take a piece, you're going to break it off and hand that around the table. And everybody's going to grab my talit's falling down. Do I got better tape? Here, Mike, work your magic. 
It, it's Dollar General tape, so pray, then use it. You, don't, you skimp on the tape. Pray, and then use it. You'll make it work. Okay. Everybody's got a piece of... The top piece of Munson. Now, here's what you got to do with this piece. On your, there's a, we call it the Seder plate. Now you got to finally get to the plate, what's on the plate. I'm going to move that salt water farther from me. If I reach left, y'all go, whoa, wrong one. Tell me. You will find a white creamy substance. That's horseradish. Now, unless you're allergic to it or you're a little kid and it's going to be, you know, you could, it's going to be bad for the kid. They can't handle it because there's nothing for them to drink to wash it down. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to right now get a piece, get, get a good scoop. If you're brave, get a good scoop of this stuff because you want to burn. You actually want, you want some, this is bitter herbs and I want you to grab it. Now, we're going to do a blessing and then we're going to eat it. Nah, just eat it. <laughs> Ready? Everybody dip it in the bitter herbs. It's the white cream stuff, that white sauce. Uh-huh. And take a bite. Oh, terrible. Do not drink your juice. No. And hopefully you had a good piece. Hopefully it gets a little hotter. Get a good scoop of that stuff. Now I'm going to tell you what it's for. The maror is on the Seder plate to represent the bitterness of slavery. It's what they endured, the pain, the suffering, the hardship. That's the idea. It's to remind us of the bitterness of slavery, the harsh and cruel ways the Jewish people were treated as slaves by the Egyptians. So you take a good scoop enough to make you feel a little pain. That's the idea. A blessing is spoken. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kitshanu B'mitzvotav Vitzivanu Al Litalat Maror. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the Universe, who made us holy by your commandments and commanded us concerning the bitter herbs. Still good. <coughs> Next, we get to something called the harosef, um, sweet mixture on your plate. On the Seder plate is the second item. It's the applesauce. That's what we're using, applesauce with cinnamon. And, and uh, that's generally something like that is what you would use in, in a Jewish household. That is there to represent the sweetness of freedom from the slavery and the horseradish. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so you take the bottom matzah. The bottom one, only the bottom one. <clears throat> Take a little piece, break it off, pass that around. Take a scoop of the uh, fire extinguisher right there, and that'll, that's very nice. And you go, oh, that's fantastic. Much better than the horse riders. <clears throat> Y'all did it? Okay, <laughs> double dipper. Somebody's getting chastised. <laughs> you got twice as much applesauce as me. That's funny. All right. Let me tell you where uh, what we just did, where this actually shows up in Jesus' Passover. You'll remember the scene. It says they were reclining. They're having the Passover. And this is when... Um, John is leaning against Jesus, it says. It says, reclining on Jesus' chest. Remember that? Again, uh, think of a litter of puppies. Okay? That's how you ate Hasava. You, when you had the, the, the Passover, the whole, the whole family, whoever's there, you're just kind of reclining on each other. It's a, like a litter of puppies. John, <clears throat> who, as you know, always called himself the one Jesus loved, his favorite. <laughs> 
is there reclining on Jesus, and then he whispers to Jesus, because Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And John goes, what are you talking about? We all love you. Who, who betray you? What? Did you mean to say that? And Jesus said, it's, it's going to be the one I give this, the sop to. The sop is a piece of bread that scoops up something. Well, it's specifically this one. <clears throat> Tradition is that the haroseth, the sweet mixture, that reminds us of the freedom from slavery and bondage. If the host scooped it, <clears throat> the host gave that and served it to somebody, that's an extension of friendship. That's their tradition. So Jesus, of all things, in this sign of friendship to Judas, he gives it, if you remember, to Judas. And then what? He said, whatever you have to do, do it quickly. And ironically, the very sign of friendship is the thing that signaled his betrayal, and it says the devil entered into Judas, and off he went into the darkness to go get the soldiers and the high priests to come back and arrest Jesus. Or they're going to be later that night, because Judas knows, they're going to go to the, the Garden of Gethsemane. How do you think about this? For Jesus to do that, golly, is that not for him to, to offer Judas a way out of complicity? You don't have to do this. You don't have to go down in history. I mean, we all know Judas. He went down in history because of what he did. Imagine if he would have softened. What am I doing? Why would I turn on you, Jesus? But he doesn't. Here, here's what's interesting, though. Usually Judas gets all the... The page time, and we look at him. He's the one that betrayed Jesus. Well, actually, they all did. In fact, the 11 other guys did it for free. They, they, they sparked on Jesus that night. Right when he was arrested, they ran off. Judas did it for pay. Next is the beitza. It's the egg. Beitza is a roasted or hard-boiled egg there on your table. It's, not, it's there because it's a symbol of new life. And I want you to think about uh, the symbol that the Jews wanted for hope, triumph, one day over death at the resurrection that the Jews believe in. And the Jews are still waiting for, they do believe in what's called the day of the Lord. God's going to come back. He's going to judge all sin in the world. And then he's going to resurrect his people. And they're thinking it's them. It's the Jews. All the Jews who have died prior are going to be resurrected. And they wanted a symbol for that. An egg. Why? Because an egg looks lifeless until a little baby bird pops out. And... Um, you know, I just want to remind you, I, I don't have a problem with Easter eggs. Especially the chocolate ones. They're so good. <laughs> they're great. <clears throat> because it's actually Jewish. It's actually a Jewish tradition. Now, in centuries past, pagans took it and made it part of a fertility, you know, belief in Ishtar, etc., where the word Easter comes from, and so usually we, if we want to be accurate, we call this Sunday coming up a Resurrection Sunday, not Easter Sunday. And uh, but again, an, an egg. Actually, it's the Jews that came up with that. And um, so, y'all get to take a piece right now. Go ahead, take a piece, take a bite. Yeah, I'm not gonna have any <laughs> yet. <clears throat> take a beat.
Next, we come to the um, Zoroha, and it's a shank bone. It's the shank bone of a lamb. Hip, it's your hip bone, right there, okay? And uh, it's the shank bone, and not any other bone, because the Jews say to specifically uh, put that on your plate, and they don't eat that, don't eat that, in uh, honor of Jacob. Remember when Jacob had that wrestling tournament with God? Remember that one? And, and uh, you know, he didn't know who he was wrestling, and, and, it, and he, he thought he was winning. It looked like he was winning, because God made him think that, until he, it says he simply this, just appeared as a man, and in the middle of the night, just, just touches Jacob's hip. And literally, it said he pulled it out of socket. Remember that? Yeah. So that's why this is here. And um, it's on the table because there needed to be protection from the tenth plague brought by the angel of death that was coming for everybody's firstborn, as we know, back in ancient Egypt. And it would only pass over the houses. The angel of death would pass over the houses that had the blood of a lamb on the front door. And God commanded that the lamb would be a yearling. It had to be the handsomest, healthiest one out of the flock. And an animal of this age was approaching the prime of his life and was to become, in Hebrew, the Korban Pesach, the Passover sacrifice. And God commanded that all future Passovers, the Passover lamb, actually had to live with a... Catch this. He tells the rabbis, you are going to pick out the lamb that's going to be the Passover sacrifice for this year's Passover. It's going to live with you in your house for four days. It's going to sleep with you. It's going to eat at your table. You're going to become attached to it. God has them do this on purpose. And you try to avoid those big innocent eyes as the father of the house would plunge a knife into the lamb to get its blood. And the parallels of the innocent Passover lamb and Jesus, who came centuries later, are striking. You know, Jesus lived with his disciples. They sure got attached to him. God let the prophet Daniel look into the future to see the Messiah. And he saw that he is a prince cut off in the prime of his life. Isaiah 53 verse 7 is the prophecy that says the Messiah will be killed like a lamb. Deuteronomy 15.21 tells us that only a perfect male lamb can be the substitute for sins. At Jesus' trial, Pilate said that he found no fault in Jesus. He's sinless. He's without blemish. Hebrews 4.15 says Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, but he never sinned. So now you have... Uh, Something called the carpus on your on your plate. It's the it's the lettuce, and um, the carpus, the lettuce, the green vegetable, is for the maimelech. The maimelech is the salt water. The focus is not the carpus. This is the transportation device for the salt water. So what everybody's going to do is grab a piece of carpus. You're going to dip it into the salt water, the maimelech. And this, as you eat it, is to symbolize the tears you would have. You know, you know, it's like you ever cry so hard, you have tears running down your cheeks and on your lips and you taste it. You ever it's salty, isn't it? It's actually to represent the tears that you cried when you watched that lamb die for you. The salt water is the focus. Representing tears, you would cry watching that lamb be killed by the father of your house. Now, after the first Passover, God added information that I said earlier, which was this, that slavery in Egypt, that wasn't the whole story about the Hebrews' condition. Slavery wasn't the worst thing going for them. God says, actually, it's your sins. 
And it's not Pharaoh you need to be scared of, it's me. You don't need to be saved from his wrath as much as you need to be saved from mine because of your sins. He says, your sins are the worst thing going for you and you need protection from it. And God's remedy, his protection was the lamb. The lamb is still today about protection from death. It's interesting that the meal, by the way, you know, it, it, it's not called the freedom from slavery dinner, is it? The Passover? Why not? Uh, the Passover is called the Passover because what God wanted them to remember most was not that he delivered them out of slavery as much as death, the angel of death, passed over them, and it passed over them because of the blood of a lamb. The lamb was then the entree of the meal. It's the focal point of the Passover. And God commanded that there would be a lamb on your dinner table. And it had to be roasted over fire, God said. Now, fire in Scripture always speaks of the judgment of God. And God commanded, catch this, that the spit was to be made out of pomegranate wood and you would run it lengthwise through the lamb from its hind legs up to the top of his head. And our lamb, Jesus, died on wood that ran from his head to his feet. God also commanded that the Passover lamb, as you're preparing it, you cannot break any of its bones. Just cuss. What does the record tell us in the Gospels? When a Roman centurion came to see if Jesus has died, because the practice was if, oh, these people are just so slow dying, you know, the Romans want to get on with whoever's next to crucify. And if somebody is still up there breathing, they'd speed it up by taking a big mallet, getting up on a ladder and breaking the femur. So that if you understand how it works, you, you couldn't push yourself up. What well, we understand historically, medical doctors tell us today, examining how crucifixion worked back in the day. That, uh, by the way, crucifixion, um, it's where we get the word you know, excruciating. Um, the whole concept, it was supposed to be an excruciating way to die. And so, yeah, uh, somehow you could prolong your life by breathing. Uh, you know, if, if your arms are, if you're hanging from your arms like this, everything's open, yeah, and you're totally expanded, um, you can't exhale. And you suffocate because you can't get the carbon dioxide out. So you literally can't exhale. So the only way to exhale is to push up on the nails, push down on the nails here and with your feet to exhale. And that's what somebody, a victim of crucifixion, would be doing as they were dying. And to speed up that process, they'd come break your leg. But it says when the Roman centurion came to break Jesus' leg, he was already gone. Not a bone in the Passover lamb's body would be broken. After the first Passover, God said that no longer could one lamb protect an entire household. God then said... You need a lamb for every single person in your house. You need a, a lamb to be sacrificed for every individual person. That's a lot of lambs. That's a bloodbath. And, and then how what would go was that on Passover, each member of the household would come with their own lamb that they've been attached to. Anybody do, you know, 4A, FFA, you know, you, you raise, you know, yeah, you kind of got attached to those. Animals, right? Okay. It's a trick not, not to get attached to those animals. And uh, so you, you bring your little lamb and you'd bring it to the front of your house and uh, you would hold on to it with both arms. And the idea was that symbolically, but quite literally, God is saying he wants you to understand this. You hold on to it and your sins are going to transfer down out of your arms onto the lamb. And then the father is going to plunge a knife into that lamb, slit his throat. It's going to Give us life for you. It's going to drain its blood there for you. The Passover lamb of Egypt 
provided protection from the angel of death. Remember this. Lambs after that were for personal sin. So in case you were ever wondering, because there's a shift if you're familiar with the Bible and you kind of go, what are they for? I mean, is it to protect you from the angel of death or, or for sin? Well, it was the angel of death. And, and then after that, it was for personal sin. Every member had to slaughter his or own, her own lamb, and that's a lot of lambs. Today, each of us still have to have a lamb slaughtered for us, but we all take hold of the same lamb, one lamb, and that would be Jesus. And the fundamental idea of sacrifice is, is substitution, which implies that there's this shocking, explicit punishment, and then forgiveness as something has traded places with us. The Passover lamb was chosen on what we call Palm Sunday. This is what God said. As the Jews, you, would, you will choose your Passover lamb on the first day of the week. That would be Sunday. Ours was chosen by his heavenly father on what we call Passover, what we, uh, Palm Sunday, which we celebrated last Sunday. And Jesus was chosen by God the Father as he rode into Jerusalem. At 3 p.m. was the daily sacrifice, and all lambs and other animals that were sacrificed throughout the year were sacrificed at the temple, but not the Passover lambs. God told Moses that the Passover lambs were to be slaughtered, not outside the house or inside the house, but right on the threshold of the front door. This started back with, e with Moses in Egypt. And his blood would be spilt right there at the entrance, right there on the threshold. And then you'd gather its blood, you'd, you'd, you'd get some of it in, in a container. And then you would, as God commanded, you were to paint that blood on your door, on the side posts and across the top on the header of the door. Don't need to do the bottom because that's where the thing was killed and there's already blood down there. But the idea is that you're sealing the entrance of your house in blood. What's interesting is on the cross, Jesus wore a crown of thorns. He was bleeding from up here. He had nails here. He was bleeding from the sides, bleeding from his feet. The idea is that there's safety behind the door that had the blood of a lamb on it. Well, there's safety behind the lamb on that cross as we get behind that door. They were to paint it uh, with hyssop. It was a, oh, call it a, a natural quick paintbrush. The parsley is not for you to eat unless you really want to, just a little bit on your, on your plate, simply as, as a symbol for hyssop. Uh, you'd gather a good handful of that stuff. It's kind of a stout weed. You dip that in the bowl of the blood, you know, and then you'd go paint your door with that blood. That's the hyssop. God commanded that the Hebrews had to eat the entire lamb, knowing that, you know, what we eat, our body turns into flesh, and in that way we become one with the lamb. I want you to think about that. And it becomes part of us. And so the Jews were not only to cover their door in the blood of the lamb, but they were to eat the entire thing, it says, and take inside of them the body of the one that died for them. And at 3 p.m. on Friday, the priest stood at the pinnacle of the temple. That's where Satan took Jesus, if you remember, to tempt him. You know, jump off this thing. And the priest would blow the shofar, which signaled for all the fathers throughout the land to sacrifice the Passover lamb. And the Passover lamb was slaughtered at the threshold of every Jewish house by the father for his family. Now, I want you to hear that again. At 3 o'clock, specifically at 3 o'clock, the high priest, whose job was to be a bridge between the people and God, blows the shofar, that ram's horn, and that's a symbol as everybody, all the fathers are waiting to hear it. Oh, there, I hear it, I hear it. And they all sacrifice the lamb. The father sacrifices the lamb for his family. Jesus, the Passover lamb, was sacrificed by his father for his family. And the Bible says it was specifically at three o'clock. Jesus actually would have heard the shofar because he wasn't too far from it. And that's, the Bible says, when he said, it is 
finished. And he breathed his last. Jesus was crucified at the beginning of Passover, which is why he ate the Passover with his disciples a day early on Thursday. That's why we're doing it. Most people don't recognize that. You just think, oh, he's having the Passover. No, he actually is doing it a day early. It's kind of strange. Why are we doing it a day before Passover? Because Jesus had to be the sacrificed lamb of the heavenly father when the father sacrifices the lamb for his family. At three o'clock that day. So Jesus has the Passover a day early because he's going to be the Passover lamb. He was crucified at midday. Says the sky that was blue and shining turned to midnight black. And it wasn't an eclipse. And it wasn't the creation feeling sorry for his creator. It was symbolic of the judgment of God. I want to remind you, in Egypt, what was the plague that became, came right before the death of the firstborn? Hosha, darkness. Darkness. Before the final plague. So right before the worst and final plague of death to all the firstborn males of Egypt, there was darkness. And Jesus is called the firstborn of God, the Father. And death came upon him as the judgment of God, not on Egypt, but on the entire world. And the firstborn of the world was killed right there, and there was no passing over him. Scripture tells us that there's a day yet to come, just before he returns, where once again God is going to plunge the world into darkness right before he judges it. We've been going through it ad nauseum on Wednesday nights. All the prophets talk about it. The sun is going to not give its light anymore. The moon will not shine. The stars will look like they've fallen from space. There'll be darkness. Then there's the trumpet. Then there's the, the vision of Jesus returning. So the symbols have been explained. And it's at this point that you actually have dinner in a Jewish household. Yeah, every year. God commanded this will be done every year. You do this, and then they bring out the food. And then after the meal, what happens? What follows meal? The dinner. Dessert. Did somebody say water? <laughs> Y'all need that right now, don't you? That's when the, the father would say, hey, kids, I hid something. Try to go find it. Remember this? So the kids would go look. One kid would invariably find it. Daddy, daddy, I found it. And they bring it. And the father would take the afikoman out of the shroud. And he would break it. And then everybody would take a piece. This is an anticlimactic dessert. <laughs> I want chocolate cake. Okay, not a dry, tasteless cracker. But this is what God commanded. And so the father would take this out of the shroud. And they'd all take a bite. And actually, you know what moment this is when Jesus... takes this piece of bread, this very piece. And he says, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. That's the one. Take your middle piece of matzah. Break it in half. And we just pass that around. So I want you to think it is this very specific piece of bread that Jesus takes and he says, this 
is my body. What, what are you saying? The one, uh, the one that's broken, that's been hidden in the shroud, it disappears and it comes back out. And here it is. And it's broken. He says, this represents me. This is my body broken for you. Take, eat all of it, he said. He would have used the afikomen, this pierced, striped piece, so they would understand what it's been pointing to all this time. It's, it's him who the very next day is going to be striped. He's going to be pierced. He's going to be this. And you imagine how the disciples will then remember what this meant. And no wonder Jesus said before the Passover, he said, with great desire, I have desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. So that you would understand what's about to happen. So Jesus institutes a, a new memorial. I want you to catch this. After his death, the lamb is no longer the, the, the focal point. It's no longer the main significance. Because you imagine as a follower of Jesus, and you know what now this is about, you go, well, we don't need to sacrifice the lamb. <laughs> He's been sacrificed. Uh, what should be our main course? Eh. This. Is this. And, and this is what Jesus now is saying. That this, is, this is the thing. The thing. And I'm sure on, on Jesus' Passover table, guess what? I don't think there was a lamb. It doesn't mention it, does it? No, it talks about this. I'm sure the guys were going, where's the meat? <laughs> we thought we were having the lamb. He's the lamb. And he says, this is now the symbol. Because no, no other lamb is going to be sacrificed. By the way, isn't it interesting that uh, the, the Jews could only, and this is a commandment of God that he did on purpose, that you can only sacrifice a lamb if there's a temple. There's no temple. Where's the temple? It got destroyed in 72 AD by Titus, the Roman emperor. He came in and he wiped it out. Imagine, remember that we talked about this last Sunday as Jesus was riding in, he's weeping. And you can imagine, he's, he knows what's going to happen. He said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets that I have sent to you over the years. Sent, uh, I have sent to you. Yeah, because Jesus is God. And he was sending the prophets, warning them, preparing them, but they didn't listen. And he saw ahead what would happen. Jerusalem would be destroyed. And then the Jews would be dispersed until 1948. They came back to their land. But there's no temple still today. So that's why there's no, there's no lamb on a, on, a, on a Jewish Passover table. Because you can't sacrifice one if there's no temple. If there's nobody sacrificing in the headquarters, no headquarters, no sacrifice, no sacrificial lamb. Isn't it interesting? God made certain that you could not sacrifice any more lambs. After he sacrificed his final lamb. Isn't that interesting? <sighs> the Jews today want to rebuild the temple though. And immediately they want to reinstitute the sacrificial system. But it's interesting, God's forbidden it. And I don't think... <laughs> you know, it's, you know, Yeah, there's a lot there. Okay. I, I'll try to pare this down. The Bible does not say another temple is going to be rebuilt. It does not. Check it. All we get in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says that the Antichrist is going to take his seat in the temple, declaring himself God and above any so-called God. So we assume then there has to be a temple built. The problem is something standing in the way of the temple right now, and it's the Al-Aqsa Mosque built centuries ago by the Muslims when they took over Jerusalem. So I think somewhere very soon in our day, we're going to see some agreement made, something that will even allow the Jews to make a little mini temple or something. Right up there on the Temple Mount, which is actually what caused the fireworks a couple days ago. It started the whole rockets being lobbed, if you know the story. There's some people up there. Uh, the the uh, Israel Defense 
forces, they, they went up there to get these people away from it, and then it became a, a, a fight. But the Jews are waiting, and there's something called the Temple Mount Faithful, if you've heard about them, and they are literally ready. They have already poured all the described, I mean, to the T, all the, the spoons, the things, the basin, the, they've got everything ready to go. They've got all the harps that are needed, everything, the instruments of all type, musical and, and the physical ones to operate the sacrificial system. They want to start it back up. They're ready to go. Still can't do it. Uh, my guess is that the moment they try and they finally get that thing built, that's, maybe that's when the Antichrist pops in there and goes, hey, <laughs> you know, I am God, whatever. And I don't think they're ever going to be able to sacrifice anything again. I think God has forbidden it forever. Anyway, there's not a need for a temple anyway. As we know, because Paul says, you are the temple of the Spirit of God. You are now where God dwells. The whole idea of the temple is that if we build a temple, God is going to live in it. God will get close to us again if we build a temple. And then we can do that sacrifice thing so we can get close to the God who's close to us living in the temple. No. But Jesus made it very clear. And it was especially in the way that he died, that curtain that was split when he died. That thing that would separate people from the very room where God supposedly lived when the temple did exist. That, that Jesus is the only way to that God. It's not found in a box. God is not found in a, in a temple. He's actually found in his followers. He puts himself inside of us. And we talk to him. He talks to us. And it's no longer this item to do list. And it's no longer all these things have to die and we have to get clean. He, he did it. We're clean. He made us clean. He made it simple. We have a third cup then comes into play. You still good? Sorry, it takes a little while. That's how it is. This is the Kos Hagula. It is the cup of redemption. Re represented in Exodus chapter 6. Verse 6, the third I will statement of God that says, I will redeem you with outstretched arms. Third cup from Peshahim 7.13 from the Mishnah. We're told that this cup specifically is to be served warm. To represent the blood of the recently sacrificed Passover lamb. This is the cup. You want to know where this shows up in the Gospels? In Jesus' Passover? This is the cup that after the Afikomen, you got to have something that goes with the dessert. Wine and dessert. Is it? This is the cup Jesus raised and said, this is this. Kaskula. The cup of redemption. Represents the blood of a lamb. He says, this is... A new covenant. This is my blood. The blood of a new covenant. Which he's going to shed the next day. Blessing is spoken again. Can you handle another one? Baruch ata Adonai Elohenu melech haolam borei pari hagafen. All of you, take a sip. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator of the fruit of the vine. So, in case anybody didn't understand this, by the way, you know when we have communion in church? Okay, the Catholics do it every week, every time there's Mass. You know, Protestants, we do it once a month. All we know is that Jesus said, do this often in remembrance of me. You know, it's interesting. Remember, this is what God, well, Jesus is God, what he told them back there, you do this Passover every single year. And he said, you do it to remember and to teach. And Jesus, who is God, says the very same thing when he says, do this often in remembrance of me. And so when we do communion in our church services, we only do these two things. The afikomen, koskula. That's it. Out of the whole Passover. God was saying, do the whole Passover. Now, I want you to know how long church would be if we did the whole Passover. 
But that's what he's saying. Not just these two things. The whole thing points to Jesus. The whole thing points to God's always been about rescuing us out of bondage, out of slavery. I mean, what happened with Egypt, you know, my goodness, talk about a spectacular, the parting of the Red Sea and, the, and all that, amazing. But how much more amazing is when he goes, I myself am going to come down and I'm going to part the way so you can get across and you can come to me. You can be free from the one that's pursuing you, the devil himself and your own sinful nature. Amen. This is communion. You know, we've reduced it to a crouton and a thimble of grape juice. God for a bit, all right? It's a lot quicker, though, of course. That's, I think that's the only rise we want to do. But now you understand. In case you didn't understand, that's the context of what we do, what we call communion. And then a fourth cup of wine. If you haven't had enough, woohoo! A fourth one is poor. You're going to have another cup of wine. <laughs> Off, Ossifer. This is kos halel, the cup of praise. Halel. Because what happens after this is all done, especially after this, oh, it's all about we've been set free. And we who are Christians, we follow the Lamb of God. And we understand the whole picture of this, not just the, all oh, this, you know, as the Jews do, waiting. I mean, tell me this. How did they miss it? How did they miss Jesus? being the fulfillment, how they miss it. And when you look at Isaiah 53, which is a Jewish scripture that says, by his stripes we are healed, he was pierced for our transgressions, all that. Like an innocent lamb led to the slaughter, you know, and he didn't say anything, which Jesus didn't on his trial, etc. And there he is, dying like the Passover lamb for us. On Passover, the moment you kill the Passover lamb. Right after the darkness fell. Which I remind you. One of the centurions standing there. When everything went dark. Imagine. The lights go out. Poosh. That really happened. On the day. The moment he gives his last breath. Think about this. Lights go out. It's nighttime, And a terrible earthquake hits it says. A huge earthquake. Boulder split. Also remember what happens? It says graves opened. And people came out and were walking in the city. <laughs> remember that part? Why did we overlook that part? This is the whole point. Jesus' death is a substitution, substitutionary death at means sins no longer hold us down and dead in the grave. And there's a proof right there. And these Jewish saints, apparently, are coming out. There they are. Um, did we already sip that one? Did I bless it? Kosalel? I'm still rambling. Okay. The cup of praise from the fourth I will statement of God from Exodus 6 verse 7. Ready? God said, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. And God repeats those words in Revelation 21 3 at the very end of the Bible when we're in heaven with him and are being with God forever. And having eternal death pass over us, which is made possible only through the Heavenly Father because of the death of Jesus, who is only referred to in, in those final chapters in Revelation as the Lamb. I want you to recognize this. Revelation 21. We are called the bride of the Lamb. The 12 apostles in Revelation 21 are called the 12 apostles of the Lamb. John said this. He, he looks at when 
The new Jerusalem comes down. Heaven comes down to earth. It's fantastic. And heaven and earth become one. And John says, I saw no temple in the city. Yeah, you don't need one. For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. But nothing unclean will enter it, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. It appears that in heaven, Jesus is called for all eternity, the Lamb. And that title refers to only one thing, Passover. The Passover Lamb, whose blood caused eternal spiritual death, the judgment for sins, to pass over us. It's the Passover. Blessing is spoken. Baruch atah. Raise your glass. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Pari Hagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And then there's one more thing. There's to be an empty seat at your Passover table. God said this to the rabbis. <laughs> you tell the people to have an empty chair at the table. So every table here, if it was correct traditionally, you should have one empty chair. And then they were told to take a glass of wine, fill it, and place it at that chair. That fifth cup has a name. But we don't touch it. But that's called Kos Eliyahu. The cup of Elijah. The cup of Elijah. So God says on your Passover table, empty chair for Elijah when he comes and give him a cup of wine ready for him. Now, why not... Kos Moses, Moshe. Why not the cup of Moses? I mean, wait, Moses, he's the whole guy that received this from God and led the people out of Egypt. What, why, why the cup of Elijah? Because what the Jews are looking forward to and God told them to look forward to is the prophet that could raise the dead. Who's that? That was Elijah. So you have a place open at your table waiting for Eliyahu, Elijah, to come. Because that's what the Jews to this day, or they actually believe Elijah, that prophet, is going to return. And he's going to show up on the earth. And he's going to be the one that will raise the dead. Mm, metaphorically speaking, Elijah, it's not that he's coming, he came. Because Jesus who had already raised three people from the dead at that time when he has his Passover with his disciples, I believe was sitting in that chair. I don't think he had an extra seat. I think he was sitting at it. So we're told that um, when they do the Passover correctly, there are certain songs they're supposed to sing. And one is called the Hallel, or the hymn. And they would sing it, and it's specifically Psalms 113 to 118. They'd have it memorized, and they'd sing it. Now, let me tell you about that. Do you remember it says in Matthew 26, verse 30, it says, after the Passover, they sung the hymn. Jesus sung that. He sang those psalms with his disciples as they were walking to the Garden of Gethsemane. Listen. Jesus would have sung these words and the Passover would continue in any other home into the night with songs and celebration. Just a matter of hours after Jesus had died and was in the tomb. God does everything on purpose. Every Jewish household that night, Jesus dies on the cross. It is finished. When they're done with this, they sing 
Very specific words. Let me quote some of them for you. Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice. For you have delivered my soul from death. Oh, he sure did that day with Jesus on the cross. <laughs> from Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us Rejoice and be glad in it. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We can do the math, can't we? Think about these things. They were singing the evening Jesus died and gave his life. We get it. The nation of Israel is still looking. Is everybody a, a follower of Jesus in this room? Because if you ain't, you need to. What do I usually say? I'd make you if I could. He'd make you if he could. But he lets you make the decision. If you haven't made that decision, do it right now. Simply talk, turn inside and talk to him. And simply say, Father God, I believe in you. Tonight, some things made sense to me. I believe for a long time you've been telling the world about what you were going to do when you sent your son Jesus to this earth to die on the cross, to trade places with me in death, to pay for my sins and open heaven for me, to free me from bondage to my own sins. I receive Jesus tonight as my Savior and my Lord. He saves me of my sins and now takes over my life from this moment on. Did you tell him that? If you've never told him that before, first time you did it right now, don't leave here without letting me know. Do not leave here without letting me know. That's the Passover. And if you um, don't have a church family, you're welcome here. If you have one, good for you. Hope it's a Bible-believing one. Otherwise, this Sunday, 10 o'clock, we're going to put out every chair we have. We're going to move chairs really close. In fact, we're going to use some of you to do it. <laughs> we're going we're to put out every chair we can because we know we had 300 people Sunday, last Sunday. We're going to have more Easter Sunday. So we're going to put them all back there, okay? There we are. Amen. 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 You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for bearing with it. It's a long thing. I know. It's a good thing. All right. I'm sweaty. I need some salt water to restore my sweat. <clears throat> so, anything remaining? We good? Elders, we good? Is there anything remaining? We just want to make sure everybody's in the family. Everybody's belonging to Jesus tonight before you, you leave this place. Make sure you belong to Jesus tonight. Okay? That's a big thing. All right. So, happy Passover to you. The Lamb of God has been slain for us. Sin does not hold us down. The grave will not hold us. And we will be together forever as family.